Here's the Amazon regional network, 14, 14 um, regions all across the globe, four more announced for, ne for next year. Great news. I love what we've got. We're going, to have 18, we're going to have 18 regions at that point. And these regions are real regions. These are AWS regions. regions. These are not, hey, I, I stuck, two, uh, stuck two racks in opposite ends of the same data center, and they're relatively independent. And there's a wall between them, so fires are unlikely to spread. And there probably won't be a flood. So those are availability zones. No. We, our availability zones are real. They're, they're separate buildings, and they actually do survive through all of those different faults. And I'll show you in detail, because I, I want you to see exactly what the difference is. And the best way to know the difference is to see the difference. Simple as that. 68 points of present, presence spread out through the entire globe. This is the one that's great. You haven't seen this before. I got a question two years ago saying, does Amazon have a private network? Do, do you deploy uh, private networks? Is there any, do you spend on that? A lot of companies talk a lot about it. Have you considered that? Yeah, we thought about it. <laughs> that is all 100% Amazon controlled resources. That's AWS. If you're flowing between one region and another, it's flowing on that network. It's, that network is managed by one company. It's not passed from one provider to another transit provider to another interconnection site to another interconnection site. These interconnection sites are wonderful, wonderful, very committed individuals. But my rule is, if you've got a packet, the more people that touch it, the less likely it is to get delivered. It's as simple as that. It's, it's just one administrative domain is way better than many administrative domains. And sometimes in the internet, weird things happen, like one company is not getting along exactly with another company, and they're trying to work on a contract. And maybe the resources get a little squeezed during that time to kind of rush the contract along. We're not going to do that. So if it's running on our network, it's under our operational control. We give you better quality of service. And we always have assets, we always have assets to be able to survive a fault. There's no way we want, a single link will ever, will ever have any impact on anyone in this room because we have the capacity to survive a link failure and we engineer it that way. Simple. It's, 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 we'd be crazy not to. This, by the way, is not just a little tiny 10 gig network. This is a 100 gig network. Every one of those links that I show you, 100 gig. Every one of them. 100 gig absolutely everywhere. And of course, 100 gigs not enough for, mo for many places. And so it's many, many parallel 100 gig links all over the place. So this is a relatively, uh, this is a pretty important asset. When we started this, I got to admit, I was a little concerned because it's really, really, really expensive. And so I'm concerned the networking team is 100% committed that this is the right thing to do. Um, from a quality of service perspective, absolutely the right thing to do. And you know something? If you, the team is really good at finding great value. And so these private resources that we have available, they're short-term leases, long-term leases, they're dark fiber that are lit under IRUs. They're, we're in, one, in several cases now, we're laying our own cable. And so everything's available. We'll do anything, that, whatever's most cost-effective to get the resources that we need to be able to serve is what we do. And because we're not religious about there's one true way and we have to it, it's, we get good value. Let me show you an example. This is our latest project. This is the Hawaii uh, <clears throat> Trans-Pacific Cable. The reason I wanted to show it to you, there was a, the groundbreaking in New Zealand was last week. It's kind of a big deal. This, this, this is a Trans-Pacific Cable, runs 14,000 kilometers. At its deepest point, it's 6,000 meters below the sea. 6,000 meters below the sea. That's about three miles. Three miles below the ocean. Interesting challenge with, I can't resist telling you this because I was so captivated by it myself. You start to get, every time you get involved with technology, you learn it's always harder than it looks. You know, how hard could it be to string a fiber between Australia and, and, and the US? Hmm. Doesn't seem that bad, shouldn't be a problem. Turns out, signal to noise ratios being what they are, you have to have repeaters every 60 to 80 kilometers. That's unfortunate. OK, got it. I understand. They have to be able to work for 20 years without service. Oh, that's, that's OK. I understand. 
I understand. Oh, and, and they have to work three miles under the sea. You go, oh, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. And these repeaters are electrically powered. Ooh, that's not good. See, now you've got <laughs> now you've got electrical power three miles underneath the sea, supposed to last 20 years, and you've got to get power to it. I mean, those really, really, really long extension cords you see used in some in some lawns, it doesn't feel like the right thing. So you've got to find a way to get power to these things. And what they do, if you look closely, you'll see the copper sheeting that wraps the fiber. The fiber is actually wrapped in copper. So if you look at it closely, you'll see there's a, there's a bundle of fibers, some insulation, and then a couple layers of copper. Now the problem is, these are a lot of repeaters, and so you have to have a lot of copper, because it's carrying a lot of current. It takes a lot of power to run them all. And you can't do that. It's just, it's not cost effective to do that. So what's the trick? Same trick that gets played on, on long haul transmission and terrestrial, terrestrial power lines. And that is, if you need a lot of power, you can either deliver a lot of amperage, which means you need a lot of conductor, or a lot of voltage. And of course, they go to a lot of voltage. So the reason why those, those pipes, those conductors are relatively small is because they're running very high voltage. This, these, these devices are running on direct current, and it's actually 10,000 volts positive DC and 10,000 volts negative DC. One more little tidbit, just because I think it's a really interesting one. If you look closely, you'll say, well, there's two conductors. What if one fails? What if someone anchors at the wrong spot? What if a fisherman trawling gets a little uh, aggressive and hopes to catch something bigger? What do you do then? If one of these, if one of these conductors is, is open to the sea, if it shunts to the sea, it's, 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 you, it's, you're down, you're absolutely down. There's not a third conductor. So how do you have redundancy in this cable? It's a super interesting, well, I think it is. It's an interesting trick. So you've got 10,000 volts positive, 10,000 volts negative. This 10,000 volt negative shunts to C, so it goes up to zero. It floats up to zero. So what you do if you're managing the cable is you lift this one to 20,000 volts. Now you still have 20,000 volts hitting to every repeater. It's the, same, it's the same voltage level as before, same difference of potential. You're using the seawater as the, as, the, as the third wire, if you will. Really cool trick. Service the, go service the cable fault and then shift it back down to stay, to stay the same way again. So one of the few times where two actually, can, when you need two, you've got two, you've got redundancy. It's kind of surprising. Okay. What we've got here is back to that beautiful network. I have to show it one more time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to choose one of those regions. I'm going to choose a fully developed region because I want to show you how big it can get and, all, and, and the full richness that's possible inside a region. So dive into a region. Let's see what we've got. First thing we're going to look at, it's an actual AWS region. This isn't fictional. This isn't what I hope it'll be someday. This isn't, uh, you know, uh, a, a artist rendition. This is What's there is actually what's there. So every one of our regions, there's 14 in them worldwide, there's going to be 18 worldwide, every one of our regions has at least two AZs. When I say an AZ, I mean a building, we'll come back to that, a separate building. Most of our, most of our regions have three AZs. All of the new ones we're building, we're going three AZ right now. It just, it feels like the, the right place for us to be. This particular one is five AZs. So, Relatively, relatively big from a scale perspective. Every region has two transit centers. The, tra the job of the transit center is to provide connectivity to the region, to the rest of the world. Our, pr our private network, our, the Amazon Global Network, connects up into transit centers. Customers that are direct connecting to us are, ho are hooking up through POPs or possibly up and through transit centers. All the everyone we're peering with through the transit centers all of our transit providers through the transit centers. And so two transit centers is another constant we'll always have. Now we've got, we need to wire this up. We've got five AZs. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to wire inside each AZ, we're, we're going to run fiber to hook up each AZ. Then we're going to run fiber to hook the AZs up with each other. Then we're going to run fiber to hook the transit centers up into all of the AZs. You see what's going on. There is a lot of redundant fiber here. And the word redundant is, is a wonderful thing in the networking world because it means when things go wrong, when someone decides to dig a hole in the wrong spot, things keep running. 
It, you, don't, you don't feel that redundancy when you're running, but, when, but when, you, when you don't read about it, it's because of that redundancy. We've got, in this particular design, in this particular AZ, we have 126 unique spans, which is a pretty substantial number. And get this, of course, all of those, many of those strands are more than a fiber. In fact, there's 242,472 strands throughout that 126 links. There is a lot of fiber strands. Here's another interesting little tidbit, at least it caught my interest, is we, we use two inch conduits, so the industry pretty much runs on two inch conduits. Well, we're running a lot of fiber between these buildings. Do you want to dig another hole and run another two inch conduit? Like, like not especially. And fibers are small, so how, you'd think it wouldn't be that hard, but you need to have strength, otherwise the fibers will break when they're pulled, so you need to have a core that's strong enough structurally that it can, that can last. Second thing is that the, the whole bundle has to be armored sufficiently well that when the construction workers pull it, it survives and it's able to stand weather in environments that underground. And so the company that we're working with is really doing phenomenal work. Is, it, it's, it's, they start in a pretty conventional place. It's very, conven very common to have ribbon cables, you know, fibers that are actually in ribbons. And what they're doing is they're taking the ribbons, folding them into a V, and stacking them. And so it forms kind of a V that fills up a, a quadrant. And then they're doing it again, and doing it again, and doing it again. And by the time you've done that, somehow they get 3,456 fibers. We're the first company to deploy this technology. We absolutely love it. It saved us a ton of money because of, of, we're running so much fiber. And you might ask, if you're in the networking world, instead of running a lot of fiber, you've always got a choice. There's other things you can do. One of them is, is what I showed you back there on the, on the Hawaii cable. That is running, every fiber pair is running 100 waves of 100 gig. You can run parallel waves on the same fiber. And, 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 and so instead of running 100 fibers, you can run one fiber and 100 waves on it. And so what you saw back there was a 30 terabit fiber with, with, with six fibers, 30 terabit cable with six fibers. So why don't we use the same thing here? And the reason is current technology has DWDM or CWDM, that's coarse wave division multiplexing or dense wave, multi wave division multiplexing, um, costs more. This bottom line is it's, it's, it's more cost effective for short distances to run independent fibers. For long distances, it always wins to run, uh, to run multiple uh, waves on the same fiber. Silicon photonics will probably change that. Our plant will probably eventually end up with, with running multi-wave. I'm very confident that'll happen, but it's not happening anytime soon. It'll, it'll be a little bit, it'll be, it'll be a little bit of time yet. So almost, those, almost all of those are single fiber. Not everyone, but almost all of them. Okay, let's jump into a fully scaled AZ. Again, remember, this is a specific region. These are, re these are actual numbers from that region. Every AZ is one plus data center. No AZ, no, pardon me, no data center has two AZs, no games like I told you. Third one is all redundant network links, we've got that covered. Final thing is, this one, is, I found this one, I should, know, I should know these numbers, but in fact, it blew me away. We have several, not one, several AZs. These are, AZs are a part of a region, 14 regions worldwide. A single AZ, we have several at 300,000 servers. Wow, big numbers. Here's a data center. This is one where we kind of go backwards, where a lot of the numbers I've shown you, I find to be big numbers and surprising numbers and considerably bigger than they were last time I showed them. These numbers haven't really gone up that much. Last time I showed you, I think it was 25 to 30 megawatts. Right now, I'm saying 25 to 32. Almost all of our new builds are 32 megawatts. Why aren't we building bigger facilities? We could easily build 250 megawatt facilities. I've been in 60 megawatt facilities. Nothing challenging about it. You run whatever you want. Here's what's going on. It's, 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 you know, the reason is the same reason we do everything. It's data. We, we just use the data. And so when you're, when you're scaling up a data center, when you're very small and you add scale, you get really big gains in cost advantage. And as, and, and as you get the bigger and bigger and bigger, it's a logarithm. It just gets flatter and flatter and flatter. And it starts to get to the point where the gains of going to a lot bigger are relatively small. The negative gain of a big data center is linear. And that is, 
if you have a data center that's 32 meg and it's 80,000 servers, it's, it's bad if it goes down, but, not, not, but we actually have a sufficient scale that you don't notice it. it. We can work through that. But if you double that, 160,000, triple that, quadruple that, start to get upwards of, of half a million, if that goes down, the amount of network traffic to, the, to heal all of the problems, it's, 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 a, it's not a good place to be. So our take right now is this is about the right size facility. It costs us a little tiny bit more to head down this path, but we think it's the right thing for customers. That's the region. Let me show you a little bit on networking. Always have to have my rant on old school networking because it held back the industry for so long. Vertically integrated networking equipment where the, where the ASICs, the hardware, the protocol stack is supplied by um, single companies. It's, it's, it's really, it's the way the mainframe used to dominate servers. And it's, it's actually an interesting observation. If you look at where the networking world is, it's, it's, it's sort of where the server world was 20 or 30 years ago. It started off with you, you buy a mainframe and that's it, and it comes from all one company. The networking world's the same place, and we know what happened in the server world. As soon as, you, as soon as you chop up these vertical stacks, you've got companies focused on every layer, and they're innovating together, and they're, they're all competing, you get great things happening. And so the same thing's starting to happen in the network world. It is a wonderful place to be, and it's, what's, what's happening is it's, it's, it's going to cause, it is causing, it's already causing, the ratio of networking to server is going up. In other words, for a given server size, the amount of networking required to support it is going up. And partly it should have gone up before, but networking was artificially expensive, and so server resources were getting stranded. Um, now, when they're moving to a commodity, um, this is no longer happening. We run our own custom-built networks, um, routers. So these routers, that particular one happens to be uh, top of rack form factor. These routers are built to our specs, and this is the wonderful thing, we have our own protocol development team. When I rant about how poorly served we were by vertically integrated routers, I mostly talk about cost, and it was cost that caused us to, 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 go, to actually head down our own path. But it turns out, as big as the cost gain is, and oh my god, it is a big cost gain, um, the biggest gain is, is actually reliability. What happens is, Networking gear is very expensive. Every company has people like me that, that have big ideas, and they say, oh, I've got a requirement. I'd like you to add some incredibly complicated piece of code to your system. And so they say, sure. And after a while, the networking gear is absolutely completely unmaintainable, and the next release comes out. They don't test all that stuff that people like me ask for because nobody uses it anyway, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Our networking gear has one requirement from, from, from us. That's the only source of requirements. And we show judgment and keep it simple. We actually, it, it's our phones that ring and it's our pagers that ring if it doesn't work. So it's well worth keeping it simple. As fun as it would be to add a lot of really, really tricky features, we just don't do it because we want reliability. So it's a much more reliable system and I honestly wouldn't have guessed that. When we headed down this path, I was making excuses saying initially it won't be as reliable. It was way more reliable from day one. Way more from day one. Second thing is, okay, you've got a problem. What do you do? Well, if a pager goes off, we can deal with it right now. It's our data centers. We can go and figure it out, and we can fix it. We've got the code. We've got skilled individuals that work in that space. We can just fix it. If you're calling another company, it's going to be a long time. It's, they have to duplicate something that happened at the scale I showed you in their test facilities. How many test facilities look like that? There's not one on the planet. So it's just, it's six months. The most committed, best quality, most, most serious company, it takes six months. It's just, it's a terrible place to be. So we love where we are right now. We jumped on 25 gig early. 25 gig looks like a crazy decision if you look at it. And I was heavily involved with this decision, so I want, I'll, I'll defend it. Um, you know, the industry standards are 10 gig and 40. Why the heck would you build 25? It's just like you're asking for trouble. And oh, by the way, it's 25 was really new at the time, and there's a bit of an optic shortage, shortage happening at the time. So it's, a, it's risky as well. But here's what's going on. If you can't take that, if, if you're not willing to find a way to solve the optics problem, you have to run 40 gig. So that's where most of the world went. 
We're confident that 25 is the right answer, and I'll show you why real fast. It's super simple. 10 gig is single wave. That, that's 10 gig. 40 gig is four waves. It's still the same thing. It's, it's basically, it's, all, it's not quite this bad, but it's 40 gig is almost four times the optics cost of 10 gig. So it's just not a great place to be. 25 gig is one wave. It's almost the same as 10 gig. Again, not quite true. It's a little bit more money, but it's almost the same price as, 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 as 10 gig. And so what that means is on this model, we can run 50 gig, which is more bandwidth, and we get to, and we get to do it at much less cost, because we're, we're only running two waves. And from an optics perspective, it's absolutely the right answer. I am totally, we're, we're, we buy enough that it doesn't matter. I mean, we're, we're, the vendors are extremely happy to serve us, and so it's not a problem. But I believe this is where the industry is going to end up. And the reason is, it's whenever you've got the right answer, when, when, when it looks that good, it'll happen. And it has happened. We are deploying these by the unbelievable uh, numbers, um, which is good. I mean, I'm glad we are. Here is the, um, here's the ASIC that runs in our routers today. I am super excited about this because remember I referred earlier to saying, hey, servers went down this path and, and de-verticalized. You, you can now buy ASICs individually, well, or very large numbers. Um, you can buy ASICs without buying the rest of the gear. Um, we're, we work with Broadcom. This particular one's a Broadcom Tomahawk. It is, at the time when it was released, the most complex by transistor count um, application-specific integrated circuit there is on the planet. These are monsters. These are absolute monsters. But the beautiful thing about this, this is a 3.2 terabit part. What does that mean? It's 128 ports of 25 gig. All ports can be running all flat out with no blocking. It'll flow 3.2 terabits at the same time through this. No wonder it's a complicated part. Why do I like that? Well, non-blocking is a wonderful place to be, but the real reason I like it is there's a healthy ecosystem. So Cavium, Mellanox, Broadcom, Marvell, Barefoot, and Novium are all building parts. There's six terabit and 13 terabit pipes parts coming. And they will be around the same price and just the same way the server was. And so now what happens is if you separate off opt, basically networking gear has two costs. It has this cost and it has optics, and that's basically all there is. All the rest is, is, is lost in the noise. What this means is this is on a Moore's Law pace. That is a fantastic thing. Well, optics aren't, but with silicon photonics, they're soon to be heading down that same path, and many of the optics we're, we're running today are, are in fact, multi-chip versions of silicon, silicon photonics. So good things are happening. Software-defined networking, big topic today, super important for the last couple of years. We've had it since the beginning of EC2 because you need to have it since the beginning of EC2 in order to offer a secure service um, as, as we do. Um, starting around somewhere in 2011, I believe it was, we made what was realistically a fairly obvious observation, but an important one, and that is whenever you've got workload that's very repetitive, and happening all the time, as almost any network packet processing is, you're really better off in taking some of that down into hardware. And so what we did is we offloaded the servers and dropped it down, and dropped that network virtualization code down onto the NIC. Lots and lots and lots and lots of gains follow from that. First gain is more resources are available, more cores are available on the servers. Good news. Second gain is Things that are hard to read and hard to understand, but they're happening, are little disturbances in the server, like flushing TLBs and things like that, are now moved off. It's a little bit more secure, or considerably more secure. If a, if a hypervisor is compromised, you still don't have access to the network because it's a, it's a, it's a separate operating system, se separate real-time operating system running on the NIC, running all of our software. That's all of our software running, running on that NIC. And so that offload does wonderful things. Another observation is kind of a, it's, a, it's an obvious observation, but a super important one. Um, and this applies to every level of computing, and so it's kind of a nice rule, set of rules to keep in mind. And that is, if you, if you offload the hardware, you run rough numbers, you, rough, you run a rough, roughly a tenth latency, 
roughly a tenth the power, roughly a tenth the cost. And so it's a big deal if you can do it. Second observation is people say, hey, the reason why we had to build custom networking gear is you could never have the bandwidth we have in our data centers if we didn't build custom gear. Well, that's not true. I mean, I can give you any bandwidth you want. It's just more parallel links. And I can do it with anyone's equipment. It's, it's, not, it's not even hard to do. It's hard to pay for if you're using some of these commercial gear, but it's absolutely not hard to do. Do you know what is hard to do? Latency. That is physics. One, one is money. Physics is harder. Physics, you've you got a challenge with that. It's just the speed of light and fiber is the speed of light and fiber. And it's just, it's, you know, there may come fibers that are a little bit faster, but it's it basically the fastest you're going to go. So latency is key. When you move to hardware, the latency is, is, is fundamentally changed. In fact, the way I look at it is I tell software people, your numbers, the things you measure, are called milliseconds. And if you put it in hardware, the things they measure are nanoseconds and microseconds. And so you're changing by big margins. And so this is the right place for us to go. Here's some good news. Here's some great news. Do you believe we're in the semiconductor business? Isn't that great? We're in the semiconductor business. That Amazon Web Services is not only are we building hardware, which I thought was pretty cool, we built this. This is billions of transistors. Billions and billions of transistors. Every server we deploy has at least one of these in it. Some will have a lot more. This is a very big deal. Imagine what we can do if I'm right on those trends I told you on hardware implementation, latency, the cost of power, etc. If I'm right on that point, and I'm fairly confident on that one, what that means is we get to implement it in silicon. So now we've got, in the same company, reporting up into our infrastructure team, we've got digital designers working on this, we've got hardware designers working on the NICs themselves, and we've got software developers. And when you own horizontal and vertical, we get to move at the pace we're used to. We get to make changes at the pace we're used to. We get to respond to customer requirements at the, space we're, at the pace we're used to. We think this is a really big deal. And if I'm right, that says that, that there's going to be an acceleration of the amount of networking resources that are available to servers, then this is a wonderful place for us to be because we're going to be able to step up to it at a relatively low cost because of some of the decisions I've laid down and are outlined to you so far. Good news there. Let's look at this one. What, one of the things that I do, if you, if you try to manage faults by looking at, at, um, by looking at basically, you, you have a fault, you go post-mortem, and you say, oh, I shouldn't have done that, and you learn from it, and then you don't do it again. It's, a, it's OK. I mean, you should do that. We, we're religious about it. But it's, I look at other people's faults and try to learn from them. And this one caught my view because, oh boy, I know this fault, I know this fault by, just by heart. And this is a, it's fun because I know it because we run at very large scale, but it's actually a very rare event. I almost guarantee you this company has never seen it before, and they'll probably never see it again. Um, but it does happen. And very rare events at very large scale happen, unfortunately, is more frequently than you think. Let's look at the impact of this one. Chief financial officer of this airline reported they lost $100 million of revenue, went away because of this fault. They, the, the cancellations are listed there. 2% of their monthly revenue were gone as a consequence of this thing. And the report was switch gear failed and locked out backup generators. Let's th I know that one. What ha I remember, I happened to be in the data center for this one. It's, I don't know why, but it's just fluke. I happened to be in one of our uh, Virginia data centers. This, exactly this event happened. Um, the way, I should tell you the way switchgear works, and I'll tell you what happened. The way switchgear works is the utility feeds in through the switchgear, goes down into the uninterruptible power supply, and as long as the utility's there, of course, that circuit runs. If the utility fails, the switchgear waits a few seconds just to give it, to, the utility usually comes back very rapidly. Most faults are incredibly short, it's not worth starting a generator. If it doesn't happen, the generator starts up, spins up to full RPM, um, wait, we wait, the switchgear waits until the voltage stabilizes and the quality of power is good, and then swings the load over to it. The poor old generators hit 1800 RPM in about 7 or 8 seconds, and they take load in about 15 or 20. It is not a good job. Do not apply to become a generator in, in a backup data center. They get the load hard and fast. Okay, 
So that's the way they work. What goes wrong is if, if there's a fault out there that looks like it might have been a short to ground inside the data center, the switchgear is smart and doesn't bring the generator on, into the load because it could destroy the generator, could damage the generator, and they view it as, they view it as a safety issue, which is rubbish. So what happened? I'm in the facility. Six hours later, the switchgear manufacturer came to the facility to explain the problem to us, and I, <laughs> the, our, our, our data center manager, absolutely apoplectic, just completely apoplectic that he's got a generator running and, and we didn't hold the load. Unacceptable. And it's interesting that switchgear manufacturers will be absolutely unapologetic. It's, it, that's the way it has to be. Fine. <laughs> there's, there's other switchgear manufacturers, so we'll buy from someone else. They're all the same. What are the odds? They're all the same. And so what we've done is the picture I'm showing there, no, oh, actually, the picture I'm showing here is that's, that's normal commercial switch gear, and we still use that, but we changed the firmware. So the firmware that controls this switch gear does not do what I told you. And as a consequence of not doing what I told you, what happens is if there's a fault and it might be a short in the generator, we bring, sorry, in the data center, we bring the generator online. We're going to do that. And the reason we do that is because that's what you want us to do. What are the impacts? Maybe it's unsafe. Maybe what, what are the risks? Let's look at it. Well, the vast majority of the time, it's outside the data center anyway. That's just the vast majority of the time. The one I, we had experience with, the one I was at, um, a, it's actually, it's kind of funny. This, this same pole got hit twice. It's a, it's a longer story. But anyway, there, there must be a bar nearby there. And, and someone drove into a utility pole, an aluminum utility pole, which fell across two, um, the two phases of the power lines, and the spike that hit the data center was, was, was extraordinary, and the switch gear said, very unsafe, don't go. Um, so let's look at what can happen. Well, in that case, it switches to the generators, nothing goes, no problem at all, that's perfect. Let's say there was a short somewhere in the facility, then the branch circuit kicks out, everything else runs fine, back the secondary power on those servers take over, and again, you're fine. Okay, let's say it's a fault very high up in the system and the generator is actually going to come into a direct short. Might, it might destroy the generator. Might not. I don't know. We've never seen it. Like, it's honestly, to my knowledge, I've never read about it. It's never happened, but it could happen. And so maybe it will destroy the generator. And from my perspective, that's three quarters of a million dollars. We're very frugal. We do not want three quarters of a million dollars damage. But on the other hand, we certainly don't want to drop the load. And so we'll take that risk. If that happens, we've got a backup generator that, to back up that once. All of our facilities are those magic words, redundant and concurrently maintainable, which is to say you can have a system offline of, and, and at the same time have a fault, and everything still keeps running. So it'll just keep running through that. No big deal. So that's what we've done on that. We're proud of it. We think it's, it's one of those details that nobody would buy AWS because we do things like that. But we had this fault twice. The Super Bowl, the Super Bowl in, tw in 2013 was down for 34 minutes, exactly the same fault. It does happen, and it doesn't happen here. It hasn't happened for years because of this. <laughs>